Can we turn it up a little bit? But it's very the highest level. Okay, apparently this is the highest level, so I should speak up a bit. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, we we'll start uh, by Ichiro's lecture on CMB. Okay, Please. thanks. Is this? Is this on? Yeah, can you hear me? Good. Uh, welcome back. So let's continue on the CMB. We remind you the power spectrum. So you do the spherical harmonic transformation of the sky. You decompose sky into hot, cold, hot, cold. That's A equals 2, things like that. Coefficients depend on the coordinates, whether you pick the uh, galactic North Pole as the origin of the polar coordinate, or ecliptic coordinate, or solar coordinate, right? But, so the ALM values change with coordinates, but the uh, uh, square, the amplitude, averaged over M, would not depend on the coordinates. So it's a rotationally invariant quantity that's super convenient, moreover, this gives you the measure of the temp amplitude of the temperature power spectrum, temperature and isotropies, because it's a variance. And indeed, if you calculate the variance of the CMB, namely you square the uh, temperature fluctuation value at the given position, you average over the whole sky, you can relate that to the sum of power spectrum multiplied by 2L plus 1, and per logarithmic interval, let's say per, per logarithmic L, you multiply the whole thing by L, then uh, this L times 2L plus 1 times CL divided by 4 pi measures the amplitude in terms of Kelvin squared, the amplitude of fluctuation that's available at the given angular scale. And remember that the L uh, or, uh, is approximately, not exactly, uh, related to the uh, angular scale, angular separation in the sky, that's pi over theta. That's exact for L equals M, it's approximate for other, other M's. Okay, so that's the central quantity that we're interested in. And it's observable. So that's the measurements from the COVID in 1996. This is the four year results. And the first thing you find that, that, that there are significant detection of these data points above zero. So this gave the uh, COVID team the Nobel Prize. First, the discovery of the anisotropy in the cosmic micro background. Second thing that pe got people excited is that, that it's more or less independent of L's, so it's so-called scale invariant spectrum. And this is a prediction of inflation that will be the subject of the lecture next week. So these measurements should be related to the three-dimensional power of the gravitational potential phi at the last of scattering, so let's figure out the relationship. So. But it's consistent with scale invariant. Yeah. There's no obvious scale dependence. Yeah? It doesn't go like that. It doesn't go like that. So the, if you, the, let's remember gravitational anisotropy for adiabatic initial condition, delta t over t is equal to one third of phi. Phi is negative in overdense region, so you have a cold spot in overdense region. That's what we learned yesterday. You go to the harmonic space and get ALM coefficients. Then you get this complicated formula. You have a three-dimensional Fourier coefficient of phi times spherical Bessel function that the people hate. This will give you the projection from L space, uh, K space, Q space to L space. And uh, we learned using flat, flat, flat scalp approximation what this actually means geometrically. I'll get, get there later as a reminder. So you, all you need to now do is to just square this, right? That's the definition of CL, and that's the result. And this relates what we observe as C sub L's to the product of gravitational potentials that are actually out there at the lateral scattering surface. In other words, 
we live in our universe, and we have our own lots of scattering surface. But if you go to, let's say, galaxy in the future, or galaxy somewhere else out there, they have different lots of scattering surface, so they will see different potentials. Are we interested in knowing really the, what the gravitational potential in our universe is? The answer is probably yes. But if you wanted to compare that measurement to the theoretical prediction, then you are in trouble. Because theoretical predictions don't really tell you what exactly the fluctuations that were uh, created in a given particular point. And in fact, this is a fascinating thing because, for example, Einstein didn't, although he was a one of the founding fathers of quantum theory, he disliked it. And he famously said, God does not play dice with the universe. Namely, quantum, quantum mechanics is a random process, and he didn't like it. Probabilities, probabilistic approach is something he didn't like. But as you learn next uh, week uh, by the Professor Cleban's lecture on inflation, now we think that the initial condition of fluctuations came from quantum processes. Indeed, God loved playing dice with the universe. <laughs> he, basically, they were like, okay, here, this position, throw dice, okay, under dense region. There, throw dice, okay, over dense region. Good. Okay, if the, if the initial conditions were like that, there's no way you can predict this value at each given position in the space. So what do you do? You instead take the ensemble average, okay? Assuming some probability distribution of phi, let's say Gaussian, you take the average of this, then you have the, uh, let's say, you take the average of the product of the phi, let's write this, now that's called power spectrum, three-dimensional power spectrum of phi. But let's, um, let's try to understand this better. It's always useful to go to real space. So we uh, inverse Fourier transform this phi to this real space phi, okay? Just a Fourier transform. And it's average of the phi at the two different locations, separated by position r, is two-point correlation function in a configuration space. Now, this quantity depends on x location in the universe and separation from it. If you assume universe does not have a preferred location, okay, all the locations are equal in the universe, there's no center of the universe, right? there's no preferred location, then this quantity should not depend on x. You measure correlation functions there, correlation functions there, Correlation functions there, they should all be statistically equivalent. If you assume that, you can integrate over x, disregarding this, and this integral here gives you the direct delta function. So this statistical homogeneity requires that uh, uh, this correlation function in uh, Fourier space is zero if wave vectors are different. Okay. This is purely the consequence of statistical homogeneity. And we now define, uh, okay, now that's fine, but still this quantity still depends upon the uh, direction of Q. Now let's further assume that this quantity does not depend on the orientation of the separation. You measure correlation function this way, you measure correlation function that way, or that way, it shouldn't matter, okay? This is something you should test, however. You should remember, always remember that. I'm pretending that this is true by, without testing it, but uh, 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 trust me, we have tested statistical homogeneity, statistical isotropy using the data as well, and all the data that we have today are consistent with the notion that the correlation functions are invariant under rotation or positions, right? Once you assume that, then this thing here does not depend on the uh, direction of Q anymore. Depends only on the magnitude of Q. This is what we call the power spectrum. So this relationship is a generic relationship for statistically homogeneous and isotropic 
fluctuation fields. So that, that, this is what we can predict theoretically, okay? So now we have this nice relationship between the ensemble average of power spectrum we see to the ensemble average of the power spectrum of the gravitation potential. But once again, this involves this nasty Bessel function that everybody hates. So let's do the same thing in a flat sky, and you relate this power spectrum to the power spectrum, but now it's apparent that uh, this is the perpendicular part of the uh, wave number, which is exactly equal to L over RL. So let's remind ourselves what this actually means, right? So if you have the uh, gravitational potential that's going, into the, uh, going up uh, to the Z direction, in the X direction, you have the Q perpendicular, that's a perp perpendicular to the line of sight. This is where half wavelengths can be related to theta in a straightforward way. Distance to this, last of surface is RL. Angle is given by just geometry. Okay, so this will give you L equals Q RL. But here, that's not the case. Angle is broader, greater, or L is smaller. So that's reflected the fact that this thing corresponds to, oops, that here, this part. And then the whole thing, which is greater always than this thing, corresponds to this. Is that clear? Yeah, so we have a nice geometrical relationship. Good. Okay, now let's plug in theoretical expectation for P here. Inflation predicts that this P is a power law with some power index N. And for historical reasons, we parameterize this P as Q to the N minus four. When N equals one, it's scale invariant. And I'll show you how that works. So let's plug this into this formula here, and you get CL of Zach's Wolfe, which is proportional to L2, N minus one power. And it's one over L square here. So if you multiply both sides by L square, L square CL, that's the variance, remember, that's the variance of the temperature and isotropy at the given scale, is L to N minus one power. When N is one, it's independent of L. This is what we call scale invariant spectrum. And inflation predicts N that's close to, but not exactly equal to one. And finding this N less than, and moreover, many inflation models predict N is less than one. Finding N less than one has been the dream of cosmologists for many years. And uh, uh, doubling up team achieved this in the late 2012, and Planck team confirmed this result in um, four months later. So, right? We're very proud of this. So I have to say this. Uh, finding this has been really the dream. If you take n, n equals one, then you get this formula. And in fact, if you use the flat sky formula here, you get one over L square. But if you plug this into this formula, and you can integrate also analytically, and you get plus one here, otherwise it's identical. Right? So difference between fruit sky and flat sky is just plus one. <laughs> the nasty Bessel function gives you plus one. Of course, flat to sky works only when L is much greater than one, so all, everything is consistent, okay? So, N is one plus two plus minus 0 0.3, that was what the Kobe saw. It's consistent with scale invariance, therefore people are very excited. Now you go to uh, WMAP. That's WMAP. What? It's not power though, right? And Planck, well, what is this? Clearly, it's not this. <laughs> Any power law wouldn't fit the data. Why? Because what you see here is not the gravitational effect. It's a hydrodynamics effect, okay? It's a sound wave. It's not just relativity anymore, it's general relativity anymore. So, Every, does everybody know what this is? This is called miso soup. Uh, it's a signature Japanese soup. 
uh, it's made of um, soybean paste. And this is something called tofu that's also made of soybeans. So as you can see, uh, Japanese people love soybeans. This soup is um, not transparent. It's opaque, just like CMB. And uh, uh, when universe has hot and dense and everything is ionized, photons constantly scatter with electrons, so universe is opaque, and this system as I show you later, this system behaves as a fluid. Photons are not fluid. Photons freely propagate. But if photons scatter with electrons, they cannot freely propagate. Right? Hence, they behave like a soup. And uh, now he throws uh, tofu into the miso soup. It creates ripples. But uh, how exactly these ripples are created and Moreover, how fast they damp depends on the composition. How much miso do you have? Right? So, uh, you know, perhaps it's really like a miso soup, no? And uh, this is a viscous fluid in which the amplitude of sound waves damps at the shorter wavelength. Analogy to miso soup really works, and I love it. And I usually, when I give this kind of lecture at the different countries, I try to find a soup that in that country that also works, but I never found one. <laughs> potato soup in Germany is too viscous, and if you put potato in, nothing happens. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, <laughs> miso soup works always. The cosmic background radiation is the wall at the edge of the visible universe. This is last of scattering surface. cannot see directly okay? the further past beyond this wall. But these temperature fluctuations may tell us what happened in the further past. The conditions beyond the wall of the cosmic background radiation could be thought of as a liquid with high temperature and high density. You could say it was like a hot soup. Something happened behind this wall that made waves, which can be seen in the fluctuations in the cosmic background radiation. There must have been a grand sound that shook the universe. We can learn a great deal about the universe if we can extract this cosmic sound. The origin of the sound would be the moment of the birth of the universe. Yeah, so you put some initial condition, sound waves propagate, and that's what we're going to study. When do sound waves become important? When, in other words, when does the uh, Zach's welfare effect formula, gravitation only, will break down? Key to the answer is the sound crossing time. Let's say you have sound waves with some sound speed. You integrate that over time to get the uh, distance that's traveled by sound waves. If your length scale or angular scales becomes comparable to or smaller than that sound of crossing time, you cannot ignore pressure, hence sound waves anymore. So as the uh, warm up, let's look at the horizon, namely the distance that's traveled by photon. From time zero to some time t, you integrate the uh, geodesic the shortest distance that traveled by a photon, that will be the four-dimensional four uh, space-time distance, and you set that equal to zero, that can relate then radial coordinate in Cartesian coordinate, oh, sorry, spherical coordinate, to the uh, time coordinate. You integrate, right? Then you get this as the answer. That's the distance that's traveled by a photon. You now replace speed of, sound, speed of light with a time-dependent speed of sound. This will be the sound horizon. And sound waves are not, not, uh, cannot be ignored if wave number times sound horizon, RS, is greater than one. That's a criterion I'm going to use. Let's calculate the sound speed. And uh, something neat happens, by the way. So I'm going to give you sort of physical argument why sound speed should be 
certain way, and then later you discover that this automatically comes out after playing with a couple of equations. So that's very nice. In fact, I'm doing this only to understand the equations that come later. Okay? So let's, let's begin. By definition, sound waves, right, is a wave whose restoring, for, restoring force is pressure. You perturb some medium, the pressure tries to push you back, then it oscillates, and this thing propagates. As a result, what you need to calculate is the response of the pressure given the, the uh, density perturbation. Delta P over delta rho. This has a unit of velocity squared, so this will be the definition of the sound speed squared. Now we are talking about system that consists of baryons and photons. Ignore dark matter because they do not scatter photons. They do not participate in sound speed. Or neutrinos, let's ignore those. We just consider photons and baryons. Ah, uh, maybe I uh, should say also, the baryons, what do you mean by baryons? Protons and helium nuclei. Do they scatter light? They actually do, but not very efficient. But uh, electrons scatter photons very efficiently by, by Thomson scattering. Electrons also scatter protons and helium nuclei very efficiently by Coulomb scattering. So by using electrons as a catalyst, photons and baryons are tightly coupled. Okay, so that's what I mean by photons interacting with baryons. Energy density has both photons and baryons, but pressure, the baryonic pressure is not zero, but it's much smaller than the photon pressure. Photons has an enormous pressure. It's actually one third of the uh, energy density in the photon. That's enormous. Uh, sound speed of the baryons would be smaller. That's in fact what we're going to calculate. All right, now we have this uh, adiabatic relationship, okay? So as a, as a reminder, what is adiabatic? Ratio of the number densities in photons and baryons is independent of space. Now you can relate number density of photons to energy density of photons in this way, and number density perturbation in baryons is the same as mass density perturbation or energy density perturbation, that's the relationship, that's the adiabatic relationship. And then you plug this into this formula, you discover that the sound speed is one over square root of three times this factor R that depends upon the uh, ratio of the baryon energy density and photon energy density. And this is neat, okay? So relativistic fluids, once again, relativistic particles are not actually fluid. But if they are coupled to matter particles, and still, but still behave like a relativistic uh, system, equation of state is uh, the sound speed is one over square root of three times speed of light. But this system that consists of baryons and photons has a reduced sound speed. Okay, so in a way, um, it's a dirtier system. Okay, your pure relativistic fluid has a sound speed of one over square root of three times speed of light. You put dirt in it, baryons, <laughs> dirt, then sound speed will be reduced. And this automatic comes out later, which is very neat. So let's, let's take a note of this relationship. Value of R is about one. And, uh, but uh, this, this is a baryon density which goes like one over volume, so it's one over scale factor cubed, one over A cubed. Photon density loses uh, energy as the universe expands, so this goes like one over volume over A, so it's one over A to the fourth power. So this ratio actually grows with A, which means this raises unity at the uh, epoch of the last scattering, but this would be very small quantity in the earlier universe. In the radiation-dominated universe, this quantity is negligible. And we're gonna use that later. And once again, my slides are available online, and in fact, if you go to the uh, school website, my slides are already uploaded there in the program as well. So you don't have to take, you don't have to write everything, uh, don't waste your time. 
uh, just uh, t uh, write directly on the slides or just uh, take a memo, small memo, and then compare to the slides later. So I can uh, calculate, given that I know the R, I know the sound speed, since I can calculate the, uh, sound, the sound horizon, and that's 145.3 megaparsec. And if you plug this into the, uh, this formula here, so QRS greater than one would be the region where sound speed wouldn't be ignored. L is roughly speaking Q times RL from geometry. Then L should be greater than 100. So if you go to L that's greater than 100, you cannot, for sure you cannot ignore the sound waves. Right? Good. So let's look closer look at uh, uh, creation of sound waves. Usually, if you read uh, textbooks, you have to deal with Boltzmann equation. And many people just give up there because it's so complicated and it's not intuitive. So I'm not going to use Boltzmann equation, OK? Uh, if you wanted to play the Boltzmann equation, read Weinberg's textbook. And I'm going to tell you uh, how it actually works physically. There are four things you have to use. One is every physicist's friend, conservation equations. Energy conservation, momentum conservation. Okay? You have to obey those always. Then you need to relate pressure to density. This is something called the equation of state. You have to specify that, otherwise equations do not close. You need to also relate how energy density is related to the gravitational potential. In a non-relativistic limit, that would be the Newton's equation, the Poisson equation. We use a general relativistic version of it, namely Einstein's equation, relating potential to density. Then you also need to know the viscosity. Remember, miso soup, you know, if you drop tofu in it, ripples damp. You somehow have to take into account the fact that it's a viscous fluid, not the perfect fluid. You need to know for, for those things. Energy conservation. So what, what, I'm, what the hell is this, okay? This, this looks complicated, but once you understand it, it's no longer complicated, okay? And what did I do here? So you learned yesterday um, the conservation of stress energy tensor. Yeah? This T mu nu, derivative of that will give you conservation equations. This is the conservation equation, one of the conservation equations you can derive from this uh, T mu nu, stress energy tensor. But this has a very nice physics understanding too, so let me walk you through. First of all, this alpha here is the element. It can be baryons, can be photons, can be neutrinos, can be dark matter. If you sum over all elements, then right-hand side should always be zero because energy has to be conserved. If there is no uh, energy transfer between elements, then you can drop this sum and the energy density will be conserved separately for photons and baryons and dark matter and neutrinos. That's indeed the case for my lecture. So let's take that for granted, okay? And uh, if you apply this to the homogeneous equation, homogeneous background, not perturbations, you get this thing here, that which you actually have seen from Professor, Professor Sheth's lecture yesterday. This will be the conservation equation in the uh, homogeneous background. This tells you how energy density changes. If you plug in, for example, P equals zero, that would be for the matter density. Then rho goes like one over A cubed, because you have here three A dot over A here. If you have relativistic fluid, like photons, P will be one third of rho. Hence, this would be uh, four third of rho. If you multiply by three, you get four A dot over A times rho. So rho goes like one over A to the four, right? So that's what we already used previously. Now, you perturb it, and first thing you see, I hope you agree, is just a delta rho, perturbation in rho. This bit is that, okay? That's fine. This is viscosity. This viscosity is here, 
because this pressure is the uh, diagonal element of the uh, stress energy tensor. And there's a correction to the diagonal element of the stress energy tensor from viscosity too. That's why you have viscosity right there. And there's a special gradient because of just how I define the viscosity here. This will be the uh, second derivative of the pi. Just, this will be, if you like, a uh, um, potential for viscosity. Okay? Then, this delta u is a velocity potential. Spatial gradient of the velocity potential will be velocity. Okay? Let's understand one by one. This, where does that come from? So, this is actually the same effect as that one. Go back, right? You have A here. But uh, as I told you when I was describing uh, gravitational anisotropies, A has to be corrected by perturbation because the spatial part of the perturbation, spatial part of the metric has this e to the minus 2 psi here. That's a, a curvature perturbation. Photons will see the local scale factor that's including also e to the minus psi. And this is just that. If you have this, you have to have that too. That's it, okay? This one, if you are familiar with, with this uh, conservation of the mass in the non-expanding medium, that's that, okay? What does that mean? When velocity is going away, if you have a sphere, and velocities are going away. There's a velocity divergence that's positive. Density goes down, right? of course, because particles are escaping from the sphere. If particles are coming into the sphere, velocity divergence will be negative. Therefore, you get an enhancement in the density. That's what that is. And that's exactly the same. Once again, delta U is a velocity potential. So gradient of this is a velocity. And you have an additional spatial derivative. That's a divergence. You have rho plus p instead of rho here because in general relativity, pressure also contributes to inertia. Okay? In fact, it's an uh, uh, inter interesting thing. Let's say you have uh, one gram of matter and one gram of photon. Okay? You do conversion E equals mc squared to convert energy to mass. In terms of inertia, in terms of momentum, one gram of photon has twice, um, huh? <laughs> not twice, <laughs> uh, this is one third, right? So P is one third of rho, so four third of rho, okay? So one gram of photon has four third gram of momentum, equivalent momentum for matter. Does that make sense? It has more, it has more momentum because of pressure here. Yeah? Momentum conservation. This looks a bit complicated, but it's actually even simpler than uh, mass conservation. This simply tells you that uh, if you have a moving particles, they slow down in the uh, absence of external force in the expanding universe. You have velocity, you know, photons, uh, some matter particles are going with some velocity. The velocity goes down by a, 1 over A, cosmological redshift. It's just that. Okay? This, now remember that the delta U is actually, once again, velocity potential. Velocity is a gradient of that. If you apply gradient everywhere, this is the uh, gradient of the potential. So this is Newtonian force. Just, you know, the force gives the uh, kick to the um, fluid. Gradient of the uh, pressure perturbation is the uh, pressure gradient force, right? And this is just gradient of anisotropic stress, gradient of viscosity that also gives you the force. So this is really the same as any other fluid equations that you might have learned in the physics courses. Just you apply this to, um, apply this to uh, expanding background in general relativity so that you pick up extra P pressure in the momentum. Yes? So 
so so yeah uh, let me repeat then this is the velocity potential velocity is the gradient of that so if you apply gradient in both sides you get velocity dot and the potential gradient and pressure gradient yeah Equation of say. So, so far we have this uh, evolution of density, evolution of pressure, but you somehow you still need to relate P to rho. Okay? Oh, and uh, another important thing. Here again, what, only when you add over all the elements in the universe, right hand side of this equation is zero. So, total momentum is conserved. But for individually, however, Unlike for energy conservation equation, photons and baryons exchange momentum by Thomson scattering. So you cannot apply this formula individually. You need to add momentum exchange between photons and baryons for individual things, and I would, 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 would do that later. All right, equation of state. So let's take the uh, pressure of baryons and dark matter to be zero. It's a very good approximation for cosmology on large scales. Both pressure perturbation and mean pressure will be zero for baryons and dark matter. For the mean pressure, relativistic fluid have the uh, equation of state of one third. So P is rho uh, background one third, P rho background one third. But if you go to the pressure perturbations, that, that relation no longer holds. You have to correct the pressure by viscosity too. So that's a relationship. Where does that come from? So this for for advanced uh, uh, participants who studied general relativity before, uh, definition of the um, the uh, uh, let's say, so any relativistic fluids have the trace of stress moment stress energy tensor that vanishes. Okay, any relativistic particles have zero trace for source energy tensor. And if you plug in, the T00 will be density, and trace at the Tij will be pressure and uh, anisotropic stress by definition. So you take the trace of that, you pick up three, because there are, uh, each diagonal element of T contains one piece, or so sum over it, you have three. Then you have a derivative of uh, Tij will be two derivatives of phi. You sum over I, and you get uh, two derivatives becomes a Laplacian. That's why you have this. So this is basically the consequence of the fact that these two things are relativistic. Okay? Just a small remark. It's not very important, but uh, to get the right answers, you need to do this. All right. So I said this already. In a standard cosmological scenario, energy densities are conserved separately, but moment of densities are not conserved separately, especially photons and baryons. So let's simplify the equations, and now we go to Fourier space. Yes? Good. What about angular momentum? Yeah, so angular momentum is a vector perturbation. Right? It's like a, it's like a vorticity. Okay? Um, scalar perturbations do not have angular momentum. Because velocity can be written as spatial gradient of a scalar function. So, in fact, that's an excellent point. This is the velocity potential. We said velocity can be written as derivative of the scalar function. Angular momentum cannot be written that way. Because this has zero curl. Right. Very good question. For scalar perturbations, we don't have angular momentum. So let's rewrite this conservation equation of energy in a compact form like this and go to Fourier space so the Laplacian becomes minus Q square. That for photon, that for baryons. This is momentum for photons, momentum for baryons. And baryons do not have velocity, the pressure gradient, so we, this is zero. And it doesn't have an isotopic stress either. This is zero. That's why this and that look like that. And the difference here has to do with the, the uh, cosmological redshift difference of uh, the baryons and photons. 
Here is the momentum exchange. Let's understand this. Sigma t is a Thomson scattering cross section, and it is a number density of electrons. So in the absence of Thomson scattering, right hand side is zero, as expected. If there's no free electrons, right hand side is zero also. Okay, very nice. And of course, uh, you can understand this. If velocity of baryons is faster than velocity of photon fluid, we want to accelerate. Photons want to accelerate to catch up with baryons velocity. If baryons are uh, going slower than photons, then photon velocity wants to go down to sort of you know catch up with the uh, baryons. That's the consequence of momentum conservation, right? Momentum exchange, baryons and photons want to go at the same speed. That's all that is. Okay, good. And you have R here. Because uh, you need to make sure that total momentum is conserved. So if you multiply both sides by R and sum the left, left hand side, you get zero here, right hand side, because total momentum has to be conserved. Is that clear? So far, so far all we have done was to write down energy conservation and momentum conservation equations. Okay? That's all we have done. What about photon viscosity? So we haven't talked about that. To get this, you actually need to solve both migration, which you're not gonna do. <laughs> Instead, we rely on the knowledge of the fluid dynamics, okay? But I repeat, photons are not the fluid, okay? <laughs> they free stream. Neutrinos are not the fluid, they free stream. Only when they are coupled to electrons, and electrons prevent them from moving straight, they behave like a fluid. But this coupling is not perfect. If this coupling is very, very tight, then you, you don't have viscosity. It's a perfect fluid. But when photons and velo electron velocities displace from each other, they no longer behave like a perfect fluid, and uh, you need have a viscosity. And when photons and electrons are not coupled at all, you don't have a fluid. So forget viscosity, forget everything. It's not a fluid. It doesn't even make sense to talk about viscosity here, okay? All right. But frequent scattering photons and baryons will give you photon baryon fluid, effective fluid, single, effective fluid with a viscosity, or also known as a miso soup. Here is a miso soup, okay? Baryons are miso. Let's solve this equation. Let's do the tight coupling approximation, namely, two velocities are basically the same, okay? So when you, have, this D is some dimensionless variable that you don't have to worry about, it's one over sigma t times Ne. So in the limit of very, very tight, tight coupling, Ne is very large, this, rate, this difference goes to zero. So we're going to take the limit in which sigma t Ne is go to infinity. Then you can take this, you have to do these two equations. You eliminate D, then you get this equation here, okay? Good. Now, I still have velocity here. I'm going to use energy conservation, energy conservation to replace photon velocity with the uh, derivative of the energy density. Ta-da! It's a sound wave equation, okay? Why is that? You have the second time derivative of density. You have a second time spatial derivative, it's Q squared here, of the density, times sound velocity squared. That's wave equation. It looks a bit complicated simply because you have the A here, here, and there, and you have gravitational potential here, but it's a, it's a sound wave. If you assume now, if you now take the limit in which, um, oh, by the way, let's see. 
Yeah. Let me. Good. Yeah. Okay. So he, this is, once again, this is what we got from tight coupling in the momentum. This is what we get after replacing uh, this with the uh, photon density using um, energy conservation. And you get some complicated thing. And you have here the term that has Q squared, so Laplacian, times density divided by three times one plus R. Okay? All we, all we did was to combine energy conservation for protons and baryons and momentum conservation for photons and baryons. We have now a single equation that describes photon density perturbation with reduced sound speed. Remember that the photon fluid has a sound speed of 1 over 3 square root. Here we have 1 plus r automatically. And this is exactly what we got from this heuristic argument using the C S square equal to delta P over delta rho. Right? Conservation equations know about that. We automatically get that. And then now we take the limit in which uh, r, which is goes like uh, a, and phi, which also evolves in a cosmological time scale, psi, which is basically the same as phi, and r, uh, yeah, and a also evolves like a cosmological scale. We're going to ignore evolution a or phi or psi compared to the frequency of our perturbations. Q is much greater than the uh, change of the times change of the time scale of the change of these other variables. Then we can simplify the equation, and that's really the uh, wave equation. Solution is cosine sine. And we have some displacement due to phi, gravitational displacement, times r. This is the ratio of the baryon density and photon density. And this becomes important later, but let's ignore this. Let's sort of appreciate, you know? It's a sound wave. <laughs> you have a coefficients a and b, which need to be determined by initial conditions. You don't know what these are a priori, OK? If you impose adiabatic initial condition, Certain values of A and B are chosen. But you don't know this a priori. You need to determine them from observations. Okay? So, photons are not fluid, but terms of scattering makes them like a fluid, photon baryon fluid or miso soup. Reduce the sound speed emerges automatically. It's really beautiful. Now, delta rho over four rho is in fact equal to delta T over T, temperature and isotopy, because rho photon goes like T to the 4. So delta rho over rho is 4 times delta T over T. So delta T over T would be equal to delta rho over rho over 4. Remember that at the last cross scattering, there's a delta T over T, but what we observe is the red shifted one. So delta T over T plus phi is what we observe. This is what we observe. We observe the sound speed, uh, sound, sound waves. RS is the sound horizon at the last of scattering surface. So when I was a graduate student at the Princeton University in the year 2000, this is what we've got, OK? It's a sound wave already here. Very, very exciting moment. And if you change baryon density, peak changes. Why? How? We're going to learn that. Tomorrow, okay? We, we, we learn more than necessary <laughs> how the power spectrum depends on cosmological parameters tomorrow. So uh, be prepared for that. But, you know, it's good to sort of step back and think about what you have done. Some initial conditions drop stones, okay? Then sound waves are emerging with reduced sound speed, and that's what you observe. But what are the stones? <laughs> OK. I mean, who dropped them, first of all? Downsides, actually, nobody dropped them. They quantum mechanically emerged. Right? That's the stone. You're going to learn that next week. 
But there's another concept you have to know. Professor just sort of said that yesterday, but this is so important that I have to repeat it, okay? It's a tricky concept, but bear with me. Um, okay. Suppose that uh, you have fluctuations at all wavelengths. Inside the Hubble, inside the Hubble length, horizon, inside the horizon or outside. Let's not ask how these super horizon fluctuations are generated. Let's ignore how that, how that happened, because it sounds so counterintuitive. But uh, uh, next week, Professor Clevan will tell you how that happened. As the universe expands, Hubble lengths or how horizon grows faster than stretching of wavelengths. So you can see more and more, longer and longer wavelength perturbations. Huh? <laughs> it's like <laughs> you get confused. But let me just say, let me rephrase this in some, some trivial manner, okay? It's just that as you wait more, you can see more of the universe. That's all, okay? The perturbation outside the horizon now, you wait longer, you see more, 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 right? But from fluctuations point of view, super horizon fluctuations now enter the horizon. Okay, that's the jargon, and that's the diagram. So let's take some physical lengths of given fluctuation. Let's say this will be the fluctuation whose wavelength is 10 gigaparsec today. This is today, okay? And fluctuations are stretched linearly by scale factor. Scale factor doubles, length doubles. But our horizon grows faster than scale factor. So if you wait more, this one megaparsec fluctuation enter the horizon here during radiation era. This is the time when matter and radiation have equal densities. These perturbations enter during the radiation era. This enters later. This enters at the radiation matter equality. That will be 100 megaparsec today. This entered, uh, sorry, what did I say? Huh? I can't read this. Uh, this is 100, yeah, that's 100 megaparsec. Yes, that's right, yeah? And so forth, okay? And this fluctuation enters the horizon during matter era. Okay? Now, what do they do? Um, let's see, yeah. This is like, you have a miso soup. And fluctuations enter into miso soup, okay? And create ripples. If fluctuations are outside the horizon, they cannot do anything to sound. Because that's much greater than sound crossing, sound crossing, sound horizon. Okay? This is a photon horizon, so it's, it's, big, it's even bigger. So you have a situation where you have the uh, cosmological fluid. As time goes by, new fluctuations just keep coming in and perturb. It's like a drum. You, know, you have a drum, and then people come in one after another, and bam, 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 bam. Okay? And this is like an orchestra. They are, they are synchronized. Because you know, they, they come in at a constant rate. One person comes in, bang. Another person comes in, bang, bang, bang. And they're all synchronized because they come in in a constant rate. Yeah? Does that make sense? <laughs> this is a picture you need to have in your mind. Perturbations come inside the horizon, complicated. But just think about the drum coming, bang, 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 bang. Then when, you know, on super horizon scales, only gravity is important. But in sub horizon, uh, but super sound horizon scale, so it's greater than sound horizon, but less than the photon horizon, then still gravity is important, but evolution is similar to Newtonian. And sub horizon scales, hydrodynamics is important, so when pe people come in and say burn, sound waves are propagated. That's the picture, okay? So fridge fluctuation enter the horizon before the matter radiation equality. The answer is, uh, in terms of key value, that's 0.01 megaparsec inverse. 
Well, in terms of the L, it's 140. So basically, all of these peaks correspond to the fluctuation that enter the horizon during the radiation era. These are banned during the radiation era. Okay. Now, why do you see these uh, oscillations? This fluctuation enter the horizon before, bang, oscillates, and ends up being here at the last oscillatory surface. This fluctuation enter the horizon later, bang, oscillates, and ends up being here. Reason why this is different from that is that this fluctuation enter the horizon earlier, so it had more time to oscillate. Right? So the, these are all patterns, you know? Does that make sense? Okay. So what determines the location of peak heights? Does the sound wave solution explain it? Let's take a closer look. So this is a high frequency solution when uh, you are deep inside the horizon. Q is much greater than A times H. And uh, um, let's see. So very roughly speaking, Q is L over RL, okay? Using this geometrical relationship. We encounter this a few times. Left-hand side squared would be the power spectrum, okay? What about A and B? Uh, for adiabatic initial condition, in fact, A is much greater than B. So let's take that for granted. We will show that later. Okay. All right. So let's take cosine. Square this. Then, and Q is L over RL. Therefore, L, peak locations, would be given by this QRS when QRS is pi you get the large value. Remember, we're square, squaring it, okay? So pi RL divided by RS times one, two, three will be, give you the peak locations. Yeah? So it will be 300 times one, two, three, four, five. Let's compare this to what we observe. That's a prediction. That's the actual peak location, and they do not match. If you actually heard lectures on CMB of a similar kind before, you might be surprised because you should have heard that this is exactly the same as peak locations. That's not correct, okay? Our lecturer said that because they probably didn't have time to explain it. I have time, <laughs> so I'll tell you why they are different, okay? This simply comes from the fact that uh, you are not really in the high frequency regime here. This deviation from high frequency actually gives you the, the mixture of cosine and sine. Adiabatic solution selects cosine only in the very, very high frequency regime. If it's not very high frequency, there's a mixture. That's the reason. So let's take a better solution. And let's go to radiation-dominated era. So this is the original equation without any approximation except tight coupling. In the radiation era, R is much less than one, so we can ignore R here, okay? We can ignore R, but we don't ignore anything else. Let's also change the independent variable from the time to phase given by QRS because we know that there will be a sound horizon, there will be a sound wave solution whose argument is Q times RS. So let's use that as an independent variable instead of T. It's just a matter of convenience. Then this equation simplifies greatly to that. Looks like we can solve this. This X here is a delta rho gamma over four rho gamma minus psi, that's argument here, okay? And I'm also uh, taking the approximation that psi is equal to phi, which is not exactly right, but it's, you know, it's good enough for getting the uh, uh, understanding. All right, looks like we can solve this. Indeed, you can solve that. That's a solution, so if cosine, sine, but then you have the term that's coming from the evolution, time evolution of phi and psi. Okay? 
That's a solution. Or if you go back to, let's say, uh, high school math class learning uh, trigonometry, um, you can combine cosine sine to have, uh, sorry, no, I didn't use trigonometry yet. <laughs> I just, uh, 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 sorry, no, I did use. So this is sine phi minus phi prime. Sine A plus B is sine A sine B plus cosine cosine B. Yeah? Familiar? <laughs> if you do that, I can uh, basically let it be absorbed by the first two terms, just change the coefficients, and you get that, okay? So delta A is like that, delta B is like that, okay? So now we have cosine and sine. Now, to, in order to get phi and psi, we need to relate uh, these things to uh, perturbations of the density. Now we have to ask Einstein to help us. Einstein's equations look like that. And remember that Poisson equation in Newtonian limit didn't have this term. Why? Because in Newtonian gravity, momentum does not contribute to gravity. But general relativity, it does. Okay, momentum also contributes to gravitational potential. That's why you have this correction. And you have all the other things. For example, this phi and psi are not exactly equal due to viscosity. And this viscosity, Photon viscosity is small during tight coupling because the photon baryon behaves like a single perfect fluid, almost. But neutrinos are not fluid, so neutrino will make phi and psi different. We'll come back to this later. But for now, let's ignore this. And the phi is equal to psi, just to simplify, okay? Now if you use this equation, then the equation we had before becomes something like this, even, even simplified further, okay? This, uh, with this, gives you that. This is the non-adiapathic pressure. This is where initial conditions come in. If you have uh, adiabatic initial condition, this is zero. So let's ignore this. Okay? Then this is a solution. For adiabatic initial condition, gravitational potential during radiation error is a constant in low frequency limit. So in a longer wavelength limit, gravitational potential is constant. But if you go to high frequency, shorter wavelength, gravitational potential decays. Why is that? It's simply because, um, well, there are many, many explanations you can do. One way to think about that is that uh, um, you know, we have density perturbations. They try to cluster, but the universe expands also. So there's a competition, as Professor says, let's say yesterday. If the expansion rate is faster than the uh, gravitational collapse time scale, you cannot grow. That would be the explanation why matter density perturbations cannot grow during the radiation era. But here, uh, the energy density perturbations are dominated by photons, so you cannot use that analogy. Instead, what happens here is that the photon density perturbations don't collapse. They oscillate, but they do not collapse, because they have too much pressure. Therefore, universe expansion simply let the potential decay. Okay? That's what happens inside the horizon. You can actually derive this relationship, although we have done something complicated. Uh, you can intuitively understand that by, because we were in a deeply inside the horizon, you can certainly use Newtonian, Newtonian uh, Poisson equation except that uh, you have to take the, into account the fact that the delta rho over rho oscillates, 
doesn't collapse. Delta rho over rho times rho. Rho goes like 1 over a to the 4. So a square, 1 over a to the 4 is 1 over a square. That's what you get. Okay? Inside the horizon, gravitational potential decays. What is this zeta? So let's define this zeta here, which I secretly put in here. This is the initial condition. It's a cons it's, uh, even better, it's a conserved quantity. And uh, you probably encounter this data many times next week, so let me give you some uh, uh, preparation for that. Gravitational potential is independent of time during radiation era in the super horizon scales. Similarly, gravitational potential is independent of time, super horizon scale during matter era, but it changes value from radiation era to matter era. So it's not the conserved quantity. This zeta is conserved regardless of content of the universe. It doesn't, ma uh, doesn't matter if it's matter dominated, doesn't matter if it's radiation dominated. And let's get that from this energy conservation equation we already written down. Except we are ignoring the uh, pressure, we're ignoring spatial derivative coming from velocity, okay? There's no velocity term here. We're taking the super horizon limit. Q is much smaller than AH. And once we say adiabatic initial condition, which means pressure, so adiabatic initial condition, I said energy density ratios is independent of uh, a space position. Actually, you can also show equivalently that adiabatic initial condition means that the pressure is only a function of uh, rho. Okay? Pressure is the sole function of energy density. If you do that, then you can integrate this equation once to get this. There's no time derivative because we integrate it. And this is an integration constant, which depends only on x. This is a conserved quantity. And for adiabatic initial condition, this delta alpha is independent of species. So everybody, all the elements, baryon, photon, neutrino, dark matter, they all share the same value for this combination. So that's the initial condition. And it's conserved. It's a very uh, convenient quantity. That's why when uh, people working on inflation calculate primordial scalar perturbations, they calculate this quantity. But there's no ambiguity. Okay? This is a conserved quantity. All right. So this is the solution. So we now got the solution. X is delta rho over rho, 4 rho minus psi. Okay? And that's the solution. And now we have this uh, correction factor delta A and delta B here. It's all given by that. And in the uh, uh, low frequency limit, the uh, longer wavelength limit, this goes to zero. Okay? And if you look at it, um, so this, this essentially sets this A tilde and B tilde in integration constants. So uh, if you take phi much less than one limit, this survives, and this is phi squared, right? But in this uh, low frequency limit, this goes to xi, uh, zeta, constant. Doesn't depend on time, which means that this term should be zero. And this term should be zero. Okay? So this means that the adiabatic solution selects cosine, not a sine, okay? For this combination. Now you, pl and now you plug in all these things here into equations, then that's the final answer. Okay? So, um, That's the answer. Huh? <laughs> Delta rho over 4 rho minus psi is zeta minus cosine phi plus 2 over phi sine phi. In the high frequency limit, phi is much greater than 1. So this is negligible compared to cosine. So it's a pure cosine. 
but only in high frequency element. If phi, so if phi is about unity, that's the scale comparable to sound horizon. Then you have a mixture between phi, uh, cosine, and sine. That's why you get shift in a peak position from the naive cosine term and you to go to the left. Yeah? And um, you can trace this uh, basically to the time dependence of gravitational potential. Because during the uh, radiation era, uh, gravitational potential is not constant inside the horizon, and this is responsible for this mixture of cosine and sine. Okay? Now, um, let's take the viscosity. Um, let's see. Good. There are two viscosities. One is coming from neutrinos, another is coming from photons. Let's look at the neutrinos. Neutrinos change the relationship between phi and psi, so that gives you the uh, important effect. So uh, initially, before already, we sort of made phi and psi equal. That's how we solved this equation and got uh, some factors. This is without neutrino. We've seen this already. Once we include neutrinos, then a solution picks up extra terms. And uh, these extra terms do not vanish in the high frequency limit. So this delta B, delta A pick up uh, non-zero values in high frequency limit. Okay? Remember that previously, coefficient of sine phi was 1 over phi. So it vanishes in high frequency limit. If you add neutrino viscosity, this doesn't vanish anymore. This R and U is an energy density fraction in neutrino that's 40% of total radiation. So it's not small. It's not a small effect. Now let's do this uh, cosine A plus B's, uh, cosine A sine B minus cosine B sine A. <laughs> I hope I got it right. Uh, then you can absorb this into a phase shift. Amplitude changes also, and phase also changes. Okay? So amplitude is reduced due to neutrino effect, and phase will be shifted from the case without neutrinos. So these are pretty distinct effects of neutrino viscosity, which you can use to detect cosmic neutrino background fluctuations. Neutrinos affect, cosmic neutrino background affect expansion history. By the way, what is cosmic neutrino background? We all know cosmic micro background, you know, you heard enough about it. How many photons are there per cubic centimeter? 410. Neutrinos, cosmic neutrino background, they also came from fireball universe. There are 336 neutrinos per cubic centimeter. And I told you that uh, CMB photons are most numerous particles in the universe. Neutrinos are second most numerous particles in the universe. There are a lot of them. They certainly affect the mean expansion history, but they also fluctuate because they're free stream too. Using this change in amplitude and changing in phase shift, we can now detect fluctuations in cosmic neutrino background without ever detecting neutrinos directly you can see the gravitational effects of neutrinos on the cosmic micro background. Why gravitational? Because the only thing that the neutrino does is to change the uh, relation between phi and psi. That's gravitational. It's a Newton's, it's Einstein's equation, in fact. Yeah? So neutrino viscosity will reduce the amplitude of sound waves at large multiples and shift the peak positions of the temperature power spectrum. I'll come, come back to this tomorrow. And photon viscosity, this will damp the fluctuation, but uh, I'm out of time now, so I'll uh, uh, do this tomorrow as well. Okay, I'll stop here. We reconvene at 11.50. Yeah. Coffee break. <laughs> <laughs>